Hey everybody, my name is Alex Merced and I'm a developer advocate with Dremio and today I'm going to be presenting Apache Iceberg, an architectural look under the covers. In this presentation, what I want to talk about is what is a table format? Why do we need a new one? What is the architecture of an iceberg table? Because that's going to be what unlocks all the benefits of an iceberg table. What happens when we create, read, update, delete tables, uh, data with a iceberg table? What is the resulting benefits of design? Like, What is the value? What is the benefit to our overall data infrastructure when we adopt Apache Iceberg? So let's get on with the story and let's talk about what is a table format. So bottom line is you may have a data lake. So I have all these files, Parquet, ORC, Avro, all stored in, let's say, object storage like an Amazon S3 or Azure or Google Cloud. But for my tools, when I'm running analytics on that data, I want to be able to recognize like these thousand parquet files as one large data set, or these hundred ORC files as one particular data set, as one table. So the purpose of a table format is to be able to take all those data files and recognize them as a single table. The idea is that it allows our tools to answer that question. What is the table? So sort of the traditional way that it's been done pretty much up till now is that a platform called Hive, what it did, it took a directory-based approach. It said, hey, if the file is in a folder, it's part of the table. If it's not in the folder, it's not part of the table. And if it's in a subfolder, it's part of a partition, and so forth. So basically, it relied on the directory structure of the files to determine what's in the table. And this worked really, really well. Like, it works. And this was a standard for a really long time. And this gave us many benefits, like giving us a de facto standard. Okay, it gave us the ability to use partitioning and other sort of efficient query patterns that were things that we just generally take for granted in like databases and data warehouses and be able to apply them on a data lake. Uh, it was file format agnostic, so it allowed us to work with the different file formats that we liked. Uh, it allowed us to atomically update partitions, and it fundamentally answered that question, what is the table? But the, it did come with some cons. Small updates were really inefficient, so if you want to update like one record, it took a little while. Um, there was no real way to change data in multiple partitions safely. Uh, if you're trying to do multiple jobs at the same time, also really hard to do safely. Um, you didn't really have, again, all the same asset guarantees, again, we're used to in, in traditional databases and data warehouses. And basically, sometimes these processes, these queries would take a long time because of all of this directory listing, having to list all the files in the directory, then open each file up, scan it, see if I need to scan it. Um, that whole process would take a while. All those file opens, file reads, file closes, uh, extend the life of these queries. Um, the way that it tracked partitioning made it harder for people who were consuming the table to write queries that took advantage of that partitioning. So oftentimes consumers would have to be really aware of the engineering of the table. And to get statistics on the table, you'd have to run these frequent analyze queries that could be expensive for larger tables and again, until you run them, your, your stats become stale. So we needed something better. So what happened is that Netflix, they were running into these issues with Hive. So they started wanting to look to see if they can come up with a new way so that way they can solve for issues like table correctness, uh, faster query planning, allowing users to not have to worry about how the table is engineered, to be able to just benefit from partitioning and things like that, allow the table to evolve so I can change the schema, change its partitioning when I need to and be able to do all of these at petabyte scale on the data lake. And basically the result of that is it took a new approach of instead of saying, hey, all the files in this folder is the table, instead we're just gonna write a list of which files are in the table, and it doesn't matter what folder they're in, we're gonna have a list that is sort of the canonical list of this table. And that is what is Iceberg. It's, it's, it's the table format that's going to fix all these problems. But what is Iceberg at the end of the day? We know it's going to solve these, this pro all these problems that Hive did. But at the end of the day, Iceberg is a specification. So it's a standard rule book for how different engines and uh, data tools can write the metadata around the files that it wants to scan. So it's a specification. It's a standard that any engine or tool can then implement. It also comes with many APIs and libraries to help engines implement that and to implement the use of Iceberg in open source tools like Flink and Spark. And basically, again, these can be leveraged so that way other tools can interact with Iceberg tables. The idea is to 
it's it's an open format it's supposed to be able to allow anyone to ingest into an iceberg table and to allow anyone to read and analyze an iceberg table what it's not it's not a storage engine it doesn't actually do the storing you'd still store your data on a like a hadoop cluster or object storage like s3 it's not an execution engine you would have to use tools like flink spark dremio to actually run queries on an iceberg table it's not a service it's not this thing that's constantly running doing anything again that would be the tools that you use it just provides sort of the standard playbook for how the data is structured okay so let's talk about like what is this architecture of this thing called iceberg that everyone's so excited about and it's becoming you know this big big discussion because we're in this new era of data lake houses and people need to decide which of these table formats they're going to use so they can get into this new era this new phase of the data lake house so this is sort of like a picture of the iceberg format, which is made up of several different components. So the first component we want to talk about is the catalog. Okay, the catalog, essentially what it is, is like the phone book. Basically it tells you, I'm looking for table one. And next to that entry in the catalog is where table one exists. Where is the metadata for that table? So when I look at the catalog, that catalog is going to have a pointer that points me to that table's metadata file. And that metadata file basically defines a table. Like what is the table schema? What is the partitioning scheme of the table? What is the current snapshot and all the previous snapshots of the table? Because we have to figure out which snapshot we're querying. Well, once we determine which snapshot we're going to query at the metadata file level by looking through the metadata, we then, that snapshot points to a file called a manifest list. And that manifest list is essentially a list of all the files that belong to that snapshot, but it doesn't actually list individual files. Instead, it lists groups of files. These are known as manifests. So a manifest list is literally a list of manifests, a list of groups of files that belong to this particular snapshot or picture of the data set. And basically there we can find, start seeing like data about partitioning that we can use to, to plan the query more efficiently. Um, and then that'll point us to which groups of files we really want to scan which are the manifests the individual manifests which list the actual individual data files and the benefit of this is that we can avoid scanning every single file using all this metadata at each layer at the metadata file at the manifest list at the manifest file we can begin narrowing down which things we need to scan because that's how you speed up a query you could always just throw more processing power at it but that costs more money if you want to lower your cloud bill the way you speed up your query is by scanning less files. And the iceberg metadata allows the query planning portion of a query to reduce the number of files that need to be scanned as small as possible using all this metadata. And then once we've kind of gone there and pruned which files we want to scan, we then scan the files uh, that the query planning has, has come up with. So just to kind of show you this at work, Let's show you a couple example queries. So here we're going to create a table. So I'm just running standard SQL, you know, create table statement. And essentially all it's going to do is create a metadata file because there's no data in the table yet. So there's no need for data files. If there's no need for data files. There's no need for a manifest that lists those files. And there's no need for a manifest list that lists the manifest. So in that case, all we need is a metadata file defining that this table exists and putting that as an entry in the catalog. Okay, so you end up with this kind of file structure when that's said and done. Okay, we just have a metadata.json file. But let's put data in that table. Okay, so if I want to insert into that table, okay, I run a standard insert statement. And what it's going to do is when you're adding to the table, it's always going to work backwards. So it's going to write the data files first because you can't really write a list of data files without the data files existing. So it's going to write the data file. Then it's going to write the manifest that lists that file. Then it's going to write a manifest list that summarizes all the manifests that are part of that snapshot. And then it's going to document that snapshot in a new metadata file. And then we're going to go to the catalog and say, hey, going forward for this table, instead of pointing at the old metadata file, point to the new metadata file. This way, any queries that come in will always refer to the newest metadata file. And that's how you always make sure that any queries coming in are always referring to the current state of the table. But then once that's all done, the physical file structure underneath this all in our data lake will look kind of like this, where we have a folder called metadata that has all the metadata and a folder called data that has all of our data. Okay. Then if we were to run a merge statement, so in here what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, I got this staging table. 
and I would like to run an upsert between my table one and my staging table one. Okay. And when we do that, it's going to be the same process again. It's going to run the query, determine what files need to be written, write the data files, then take those data files, list them in a new manifest file, take that manifest file and any previous ones that are still applicable and list them in a manifest list. And then that manifest list becomes a new snapshot in a new metadata file, which then the catalog is now going to point to going forward, resulting in a change of our file structure like so. So again, we, every time, and again, basically we're never editing old files. It's all um, immutable. We always write new data files for any new data coming in, which returns into new manifest lists. Um, and then that's a new snapshot. So it's always kind of moving forward, but because we have all those old files, we're going to be able to query the previous states of the, the table, which you know enables what's called time travel. Now, now that we have data in the table, let's actually query the data. So if I want to do a read on the table, I just do a standard, let's say, select all from the table. So whatever query engine you're using, again, that could be a Flink, that could be a Spark, that could be a Dremio, that could be a Trino, it could be whatever. What happens is that it's going to start out by going to the catalog and saying, hey, I'm looking for this table. And that entry is going to say, okay, well, the newest metadata file for this table is over here. I'm going to go look at that metadata file as the engine. And I'm going to say, okay, well, I didn't specify a snapshot, so we're going to assume I want to look at the current snapshot. So I look at the newest snapshot, which is S2 in this image. That snapshot then points to a manifest list, which then has a list of all these manifests with the files for that table at that point in time. In this case, it's just a select all query, so I'm just going to scan all of it. But if I had filters, I would then use the metadata to begin filtering which files I need to scan. But then again, I just go and I scan the table there. Again, we're not writing a new snapshot because we didn't change the table. We're just reading the table. So this is where we start seeing that benefit of what's called snapshot isolation. Okay. But to see like the benefit of all this, like to see how this structure allowed query engines to really perform at a much better pace, let's take a look at the benefit that Netflix experienced. They had this system called Atlas, which was basically a telemetry uh, data system. And originally they were using hive tables. They did have parquet filters, so basically would read the different like uh, headers and footers in the parquet file to kind of limit which row groups they wanted to scan. But even then, when it was scanning with the parquet filters, you had 400,000 splits per day. And again, more splits, the more things you need to scan. And this is not 400,000 splits total, this is 400,000 splits per day of data. Okay? So what happened is that just to plan the query. So when we do run an explain query, we're not actually running the thing. We're just saying plan the query as if you are going to do the thing and come back to me with how long it takes me to do the thing. So at 9.6 minutes just to plan the query, not even run the query, just plan it. Now watch what happens when we introduce iceberg with partition data filtering. So that means using any partitioning that that table has to reduce big chunks of files so let's say I partition by like month. I say, hey, I only want to create this month's worth of data. So then it kind of ignores all other data except for the data for that month. But once we use partition data filtering, we reduce the number of splits to 15,218 total. Okay, so that's a lot less splits, a lot less things to scan, faster query. How much faster? Well, the total was 13 minutes to so do the whole thing. That's the planning and the actual running of the query. So just for a few more minutes, you're able to do the whole thing. Okay, and the actual planning was only 10 seconds. So that planning went from 9.6 minutes to 10 seconds. So the most of that 13 minutes was the actual execution of the query. That's a huge performance boost when you're querying your data lake. And it gets even better because, you know, 13 minutes, that kind of a difference is great, but, you know, can we make it better? And we do. What they do is they, they, they use min-max filtering. So min-max filtering is when you get to that manifest level and you're assessing the individual files, there's metadata on each column, and you can use that metadata to determine whether that file um, is worth looking at for your particular query. So you can narrow it down even further. And there, the number of splits that had to be scanned got reduced to 412 total, a lot, lot less, a lot more than, a lot less than that 400,000 a day. So now the query total took 42 seconds. Okay, so we've got, went down to 9.6 minutes to plan the whole thing, to 42 seconds to execute the whole thing. Now, the planning took a little bit longer because you're doing a little bit more planning to narrow down all those files, but that little extra time planning saved you a lot of time in execution.
because you're scanning less files. So when you scan less because you plan smarter, you end up with a faster but also cheaper query because you're using less compute, which means a smaller cloud bill at the end of the month. Okay, so again, the benefits of Iceberg, you can efficiently make small updates because it's granular. The way it has all that metadata, you can actually go update a record without it being a very expensive query. You have snapshot isolation, which is going to enable things like concurrent, like uh, concurrent writers and concurrent reads without any problem. You have faster planning and execution because you have all that metadata that really improve narrowing down what you want to scan. You're going to have reliable metrics because it's updating. That metadata has the stats for the table, and that's being updated every time you write to the table, so you don't have to run these analyze queries. You're going to be able to do time travel. You're going to be able to scan previous snapshots of the table. Okay. Um, to allow you to do all sorts of really cool things like uh, running models on, on, on consistent data that uh, when you make changes to them. Uh, table evolution, you're gonna be able to change the schema of the table any way you want. You can also change the partitioning of the table, which is something only Iceberg can do. So if you were partitioning the data by year and now you wanna partition it by month, you can do so without having to rewrite the whole table, uh, which is a, can be a huge time saver when you're talking about petabyte scale tables. And all engines, because of that snapshot isolation, because of that design, I could be doing an update, ingesting data via Flink, and then running a query in Spark, and Spark is seeing all those updates real time. Um, there's no having to worry about syncing different users, scanning that same data set between different engines, because they're all referring to that catalog, which always points to the newest metadata file. So you have that uh, consistency of the data, regardless of what tool you're using, when you're using it. Uh, you have asset transactions. So again, you're going to be able to update, delete data. And if you add in another open source tool called Project Nessie, you're going to get a couple extra benefits like Git like semantics. That's right. Being able to do things like branching of a table and merging those branches after you've done work so you can isolate ETL work. So that way I can do operations on like five related tables um, in isolation on a branch without all my consumers querying uh, partial changes and then merge that branch once all my changes are complete. So that way my consumers see going from point A to point B as one big multi-table transaction. Okay, so that's a really cool thing with Project Nessie if you pair that with Iceberg. So if you want to learn more about Iceberg, head over to iceberg.apache.org. Um, you can also head over to dremio.com slash subsurface. That's where you'll find a lot of the pieces that I write. I'm part of the subsurface team over there at Dremio. Um, at this time, we'll have uh, re released a Apache Iceberg 101 course so with a, plenty of videos and links to a lot of great resources all across the web on how to uh, implement Apache Iceberg in your data uh, architecture. And if you want to get hands-on, you can check out the Iceberg documentation. And they have a getting started article at iceberg.apache.org slash getting started. Again, I want to thank you all for attending this presentation. My name is Alex Merced. You can follow, you can follow me on Twitter at amdatalakehouse. And I'm always constantly putting out uh, all sorts of great content about just data lakehouse architecture. And you can also always reach me at alex.merced at dremio.com. You guys have a great day. Um, enjoy the rest of P99 Talk.